Digital Marketing Transformation, The Case of Microsoft, uh, featuring Valerie Boyu, the Chief Marketing Officer from Microsoft US. Thank you, Valerie. Do you know we are all in danger here? Are you aware of that? From the latest research, over 50% of us will not make it in the next three years. And according to Corn Ferry, the, re the research they released in January, the vast majority of us will not make past the four years mark. And why is that? We are the shortest lift in the C-suite. The pace of change, as Jay just shared with us, the horrendous pressure to continue to deliver creative experience and memorable experiences, the pressure to keep and drive impact, this is what makes it super hard to survive as a CMO. What I'm going to share in the next 20 minutes or so is my own observation and my own learning with all humility on how we try to cope with that complexity at Microsoft. And I will share with you a tale of three to make it simple, so that together we try to go past the fatal 33 months. Is that a deal? Let me start by sharing with you a few trends, three trends, that wherever I go in the US and also when I was uh, posted in Asia and before that in Europe, we've observed and seems to be really the uh, convergence of what we see today in the markets. First, even when you are in the B2B space, your customer's expectations are shaped by their consumer experience. Second, board's pressure on CMO to drive the transformation is accelerating. And not only to drive the transformation, but also to continue to drive the here and now lifetime value of your customers. Three, we also have to keep our teams going and to transform themselves to be able to achieve the first two. And let me unpack what it means quickly. You are consumers, and Jay was reminding us we all have smartphones, we order online through voice, command, etc. That's what you will be compared to if you are in the B2B space. Make no mistake. You no longer compare to the experience that your customer will have with your competitor. Your experience will be compared to what they have as a consumer. They expect you know them, not only by name, but also by function. Do you imagine I'm a technology company? If I talk to you guys, CMOs, do you expect that I will tune my message to a more business-like rather than uh, inundating you with technology? Probably so. You would probably like that I know that you prefer the Oscar ceremony than the Super Bowl, so that when I send you my next event invite, it will tap into what you like. Probably so. Also, you expect that I am able to provide a seamless conversation. Whether you have, are at a marketing event or you're talking to my salesperson, same story. If you were at an event to understand how technology can transform marketing, you probably don't expect to receive a call to talk about office in retail. So having that seamless expectation is something that is uh, coming very strongly at us, and consumer experience is a baseline even for B2B marketing. Second trend, pressure from the boards. It's hard enough when you're a seller to know what your customer expects. The boards and our leadership team expect us, CMO, to know what customer expect at scale. So to Jay's point, how do we organize all these data estates so that we can surface the insight on customer behaviors? They're also expecting us, by the way, our leadership on boards, that we can identify in advance ahead of time what will be the next disruptive trends. So the pressure is really intense. And at the same time, you need to keep abreast with all that's new and happening in the marketing sphere, online, offline, social, new media, so that you can always offer the top experience and the best experience for your customers and get out of the clutter. And this is not all. And the third trend, and mind you, this was the one I thought it was only for me, but as I talked to a lot of you around the country, it seems that we're all struggling with the same issue. How do we keep 
our teams at the pace of change we need them to go for. And there is a fundamental transformation in the profile of the people we need to have in our teams. In my experience in marketing, in B2B marketing, we had people who are beautiful experts in program management. They do fantastic events, they do great emails, high-level campaigns, but do we have the right creativity to write blogs, to publish the right pictures, to participate in social conversations? Do we create this memorable and unique experience that will help us get out of the clutter again? At the same time, can we reconcile left brain and right brain, making sure that these same people, or at least in the same team, are able to look at the data, understand the insight that this data is bringing so that you do the right retargeting, you tune your messaging, and you adjust your conversations. It's very, very hard. And that's one of the challenges we're all facing. I'm going to talk about that later. And in this environment of change, there are things that don't change. And among the things that don't change is the overall priorities that we all have as marketing officers, which is we are accountable for the reputation of our companies, making sure that we have the right awareness about our brands and we have the right positive sentiment. And I absolutely love when Jay was talking about trust because this is also a trend that we are seeing very strongly as we move from building brand loyalty to building brand trust. Absolutely agree. And that's a huge shift in how you're thinking about your impact and what you need to put at play. The second thing we need to continue doing is obviously drive demand. Every seller will look at your mar uh, you marketing saying, hey, how many leads did you bring me today? How much did you feed my pipeline? That continues to be a huge imperative in what we have to drive. And last but not least, we also have to contribute to accelerating the productivity of our sellers, enabling them and enabling the customer so that they are the most mature when we hand off the lead to the seller so that we reduce cost of sales. So as you see, these priorities really span across a broad set of priorities that makes our job super hard. So how do we do at Microsoft to cope with this transformation? And there are really three pillars. Three trends, three priorities, three pillars. It's easy, it's everything three for my presentation. The first one is culture, purpose. That was what Jay was saying, purpose, culture, absolutely one pillar. The second pillar is capability. And the third pillar is about technology. Let me go one by one. When Satya Nadella, Microsoft new CEO, joined five years ago, I think almost for the day, actually he joined in uh, February, early February. The first thing he did, despite the fact that we are a long tenure company, was to rally his leadership team into defining the new mission for Microsoft. You would say, yeah, that's pretty obvious. Uh, well, this was not a small deed because we had to move from Windows is the air we breathe to something completely different that will put customer first and DNI at the center of what we were trying to achieve. And to make sure that he would rally first his leadership team and that top down we would guarantee a consistent customer experience anywhere you touch the company, no matter if you were touching the products, no matter if you were touching the sales team, no matter if you were interacting with marketing, the culture and the main narrative would remain the same. For me, it's a real pleasure to be able to really build on top of this super strong culture that will allow me to be absolutely authentic with the narrative I am putting out there. That's why culture is so critical. The other thing that is critical is capability. I talked to you and I shared with you just a minute ago the challenges we have with transforming our teams. And you can imagine that moving from such a drastic change in culture at Microsoft, we had the usual threesome. The people who embraced the culture immediately, probably 10, 20% of them. The vast majority were, yeah, following. Yeah, we'll get there. And then the third will just never get there. And so we had to rethink how we were recruiting. So the first thing as a marketing leader, I had to change some of the profiles. As I mentioned, I never recruited data scientists before. 
I never recruited developers so that they can use the MarTech and link into my data infrastructure. These were profiles I didn't have in the past. So how do I get to uh, recruit these people? I also have to recruit more digital native, changing also the profile in terms of generation of people and having the right mix in my team. And how do we do that? We cast the net broader. We're looking at people coming right out of university. We're looking at people with experience in the industry we're addressing, our customer industry, so that they speak the language. And the other thing that I've done is, because of that pace of change that I was mentioning before, it's not good enough to just have the right profile. You need to make sure that you have people who are able to constantly learn. That's the growth mindset that is so much hype at the moment. And as you get there, you need to have the right programs. And I have in my team a person who's dedicated to onboard all the new recruits and develop the program so that they stay at the top of their art in terms of marketing trends. So that's an investment that we made to be true to the culture we want to drive. This is usually where I get most of the question. How are you organized to make that happen? And there are a few things I want to highlight. Of course, we are an international company, so we've been doing global advertising, global demand for a long time. But until very recently, and I would say before Satya and Adela joined, every brand, every geo could do above the line. As you can imagine, this resulted in clutter and noise. How can you build a consistent brand personality and tone of voice when everybody can speak? And so the first thing we did we regroup above the line into a central organization to clarify our personality, point one. The second thing we've done, which was a little more controversial, well, a lot more controversial, and I was in the countries at the time, not in, uh, in, at Corp, was to build a global demand center. And that completely makes sense. Because the first thing you want is to make sure you have one 360 view of your customers. Jay was talking about, hey, it's important to know what your customers are doing. Absolutely, end to end, from marketing to sales to technical support to customer services, you need to have one single ID, and that's what we've done. We built an infrastructure that enables us to really follow all the touch points across the, uh, the customer experience. You can imagine this would have never been possible if we would have kept the global, the demand centers in each of the countries. Now we're able to monitor and to learn from the vast variety of experiences all around the world, and that helps us a great deal to design how we go next in the customer journey. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And that goes to what we do in market. So I'm responsible for marketing in the US for B2B. And so I'm building on top of what Global is doing in terms of customer acquisition, top of funnel acquisition, top of funnel activities to really build all the nurturing journey for our customers. That's what we are responsible for in each of the countries. And the way I do that, first, I have a, an account-based marketing team, ABM, that's very hype at the moment, but it works. Not for everyone. I probably today have a 200 accounts, more or so, that I am uh, managing alongside the sales team where we built account plans that will have a sales portion and a marketing portion to make sure that we are to the closest to the customer needs and we have marketing activities that are extremely tailored to these big accounts. Obviously, I'm talking about these humongous accounts where you have multiple projects that you have at the same time and where a one-size-fits-all would not work from a marketing approach. So very limited, very targeted, but that really, and we see, uh, we've been doing this for the past 12 months approximately, and we see this is unlocking opportunities that we never had access before, as we are much more targeted to go after them. The second thing we have, and it's in no particular order, by the way, is a customer experience team. As I mentioned before, you can be the smartest you want from a data point of view. If your landing experience is crap, the customer will go away. And remember, baseline consumer experience. So we need to make sure that we have a team that brings the big best experts together to deliver the best experience across the digital destination, events. We still do events. I get this question, oh, you're still doing events? Yes, I'm still doing events. Not so much to do recruitment, remember. My acquisition, top of funnel, this is my global demand center. 
I'm doing events to really nurture the customer along the journey. I'm in the B2B space. And so making sure that we're still doing events. And also sometimes good old offline works. Billboard in DC, I can tell you, works. Radio in DC <laughs> works. Leaving books at customer events works. So making sure that we have the right mix continues to be important, and digital is not the only answer. You really have to activate the mix. The other team that I have is an industry team. As I mentioned before, making sure that you have the right language and you speak the customer language is absolutely critical. And to have industry people will really be able to translate your solutions into industry speak, vertical speak, is absolutely critical to really make sure that you are engaging the customers when they, where they need you to be engaged. Integrated marketing, we are a product, team, product group, and I have to have a marketing team who's basically talking to my product groups and my engineering and translating all the new functionalities that they are bringing up into a solutions area for my customers. That's what my integrated team does. And at the bottom, as a foundation, it's my analytics and marketing operations team. This is my biggest team, by the way, in terms of number of people. They drive all my marketing automation. All the links, this is where I have developers. I didn't even knew I had developers before. This is, this is where I have people bringing together, wiring together uh, sophisticated MarTech to data infrastructure. And this is where I have all the analytics and the insights and the correlation work that we need to drive to make sure that we know where we're driving impact. Technology. Technology is critical today. And when you think about Microsoft, Jay was talking about all my competitors, Facebook, Google, Amazon, but uh, what do they have in common that I don't? They are all digital companies. So from their inception, they were tracking data on their customers. I didn't. So how do I recoup that uh, path that they have ahead of me? Well, by doing intense listening, I'm going to share that with you, by making sure that I understand their journey, hence the global infrastructure to make sure that I follow what they do, the interaction that they have with me. So knowing your customers and having the technology and being very intentful in what you're trying to capture to understand the journey is one of the things that you have to do. Obviously, the rest is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's about managing the performance, understanding how your uh, assets are doing in terms of uh, attendance of events, download of ebooks, participation to webinars, etc., and making sure that you proactively managing performance of your assets. I know you're doing this with your own agency, like weekly tuning of messaging that works, etc., and of course measuring impact and understanding ROI. So let me close by giving you three very concrete examples of how all I mentioned to you is coming to light for Microsoft. The first one is around social engagement. You remember at the beginning I told you, hey, customers, even in the B2B space, they want to have the same intimacy that they would have with the consumer brands. So we have to move into listening to them and making sure that we have a feedback loop and we participate in the conversation in a proactive fashion. We built a customer experience center where today we are monitoring more than 30 brands. This represents almost a billion impression a day that we are monitoring. Obviously, we can't do that alone. I have 75 community uh, managers who are uh, tuning their message, having, and they're talking to creative directors so that we tune the message real time. But more importantly, I have technology that's using machine learning and artificial intelligence is sorting through all the conversation to surface the conversation that I'm meaningful where I need to be involved. It can be reactive, but it can be also proactive in determining the, te the themes that I need to engage proactively to participate in the conversation that matters. So that's one example, a huge investment that we've made here, but which allows us to also get feedback on what's top of mind for our customers. The second example is how we're leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence to accelerate the connection between sales and marketing. As I mentioned, with this global demand center, I am able to follow the journey of my customer. And I am also able to understand What's the best sequence, though in the multi-touch it's not really a sequence, what's the, mess, the best array of interaction will lead to the highest propensity to convert into a sales opportunity? 
So at first, we fed the machine with some of our own observation. For example, if you come to an event and then you go into a technology immersion center, your propensity to convert into a sales opportunity was super high. So we started to teach the machine on how to recognize these patterns so that we could score the leads. And based on that, we are able now to surface the leads with the highest scoring to our inside sales so that they can prioritize who they call first. You can imagine inside sales, thousands of customers in their portfolio. In which order do I start to call? So what we are doing, we have a daily recommender where the inside sales can open their screen every morning. They have their top 10 customers ranked by the score of their leads and marketing interaction. And when they click on the customer, they have this one pager where they have the latest of the conversation to avoid talking to retail to a manufacturing customer. Last example, moving from data to insight. I don't know you, but when I started to look at insight, my life looked like that. Dashboard everywhere. Pipeline reports, events reports, Google search. Yeah, I do Google search as well. I need to say that. I love Bing, but I do Google search as well. Well, reports, reports everywhere. I, I, I'm sure you've, you've lived through that. Like 60, 70 reports coming all the way, making sense, recouping the data, just a nightmare. So as a marketing team, we thought, okay, let's develop dashboard based on personas. And so we created three big categories of persona to really surface the data that was useful for your job. So the first persona was making sure that marketing people get the right information to drive the next best activity. So quality control, obviously. Am I doing the right narrative? Is it the right messaging? I have the right attendance to my events. What's the next logical events or assets I need to direct my customer to? This is for the field marketing people having their own dashboard. Obviously, they can personalize, but at least what's in that dashboard is tuned to their needs. The second persona was to a sales manager. As a sales manager, I don't care so much if after the events you need to download the ebook and then you need to go to an immersion center, etc. What I care about is who did you engage in, in my portfolio of customers? How much are they engaged and what are they engaged on? That's what I need to know as a seller. I don't need all the, the other rest of the details. So that was the second persona. And the third persona is for executive. People like me, I just want to know where is my money going? Where do I get the best return on investment? Where do I need to invest more? And next, where is my investable model? And so by creating this persona, we clarify a bit of the noise on all these data and we try to make sense to make it more usable. So in short, three trends, three priorities, three pillars at Microsoft to build our transformation, and these three examples, which I hope are inspiring you in your own digital transformation and will help you survive successfully the next 33 months. Thank you very much.